I'm Craig Taylor, chair of the physics department. We in the department are very concerned about safety for several reasons. The most important reason, of course, is that we care about your health and welfare. When you were born, you were issued a specific number of body parts, and they have to last you a lifetime. Plan on leaving the department with as many fully functioning parts as you had when you arrived. Seriously, even if you don't care about your own personal safety or welfare, please remember that unsafe practices are costly to the department and usually illegal. I have learned over the years that most safety rules are developed for very simple common sense reasons. By learning and following these rules, you can help the physics department maintain its excellent safety record. Thank you for your help. Thank you, Craig. I'm Matt DeLong, and I'm here with my colleague Dave Keita to give you some important information about working safely in the University of Utah Physics Department. It's generally accepted that there are two major causes of accidents, ignorance and carelessness. Ignorance, by the way, means lack of specific knowledge or information. We're here to give you that knowledge and motivate you to work carefully and safely. Keeping the workplace safe isn't just a legal requirement. It also makes good sense from both a management and a simple social standpoint. Let me begin by pointing out to you several sources of health and safety information. The first one is the opening section of the University of Utah Campus Directory. On pages three and four of this year's Campus Directory, which, by the way, is issued to all faculty, staff, and students, is emergency information on dealing with situations such as reporting an emergency, what to do with medical emergencies, fire, bomb threats, robbery, assault, chemical spills, earthquakes, winter storms, all that sort of thing. Again, this is available to all faculty, staff, and students. You probably have a copy on your desk. A second valuable source of information, the Physics Department Safety Manual, is issued to all employees and is now on the web, accessible from the department homepage. It contains a wealth of useful information on health and safety issues, and in fact is the background information from which much of this video is taken. If you do not have one, please contact the Departmental Administrative Officer, currently Lynn Higgs, in the main office, 201 JFB, or call extension 17140 to obtain a copy. Another source of information which has recently come online is the University Department of Environmental Health and Safety, EHS, webpage, including the Waste Management and Pollution Prevention Manual. Its address is http colon slash slash www.ehs.utah.edu slash. If your position in the, in the department does not give you direct access to the internet, you may access it on one of the terminals here in 210 JFB. Room access, a computer account, and instructions on using these terminals is available from the Department Computer Systems Manager, currently Carlton Dittar. You can also access it from the university's homepage, http colon slash slash www.utah.edu. On that homepage, click on Campus Information, simply scroll down a few screens, and click on Environmental Health and Safety. Another important source of information is the Emergency Response Guide. These are posted inside of most laboratories and give you specific information on what to do and who to call in case of emergencies. Personal injury, fire, radiation spills, chemical spills, biological spills. Again, these are posted by the door inside of laboratories in the building. It's also important that you know the location of various emergency facilities within the department. Specifically, emergency showers, adjacent to the janitor's closets in JFB, eye wash stations. There's one on the third floor, one in the department chemistry room, fire extinguishers across from the east stairwell in JFB. Specifically, the next time you go back to your office and lab, take a hike, walk up the hall one way, walk up the hall the other way, locate the nearest fire extinguisher, the nearest eye wash station, the nearest shower. That way, when you need them in an emergency, 
You'll be able to dig down into the dim, dark past and repeat the exercise. Now let's continue with some specific information. This is a high-pressure gas cylinder. There are several things you need to know about how to use it safely. Whenever in use, it must be chained to a holder, either using a fixture like this one or simply chaining the cylinder to the unistrut that is common throughout the building. The gas is removed from a high-pressure cylinder by using a regulator and, of course, the cylinder valve, which is an integral part of the top of the cylinder. Please bear in mind that the regulator is what you use to adjust the delivery pressure and that turning the regulator knob in increases the delivery pressure. Turning the regulator valve out or counterclockwise reduces the delivery pressure and in fact eventually shuts off the flow entirely. This mode of operation is counterintuitive. The first time you use a regulator, you should seek instruction. When you're transporting a high-pressure gas cylinder from one location to another, begin by removing the regulator and replacing the bonnet. When these gas cylinders fall over, the major danger is in breaking off the cylinder valve at the top, at which point the cylinder becomes a lethal rocket capable of penetrating masonry walls, to say nothing of the plastic ones in the physics building, a highly undesirable event. Also common in the laboratory is a class of devices that are belt-driven. A common example is the mechanical vacuum pump, as demonstrated here. The point that we want to make is that this one is equipped with a belt guard. The general rule is all mechanically driven devices with external belts, like this one, must have a belt guard in place so you can't accidentally bump into the belt, or even worse, pinch your fingers between the belt and the pulley. Another general rule to be observed in the laboratory or anywhere else in the building is don't run in the halls. I'm here as a demonstration object. The crease in my skull is a result of a trip and fall accident while running in the halls. I tried to take out a door frame with my head. We have living proof that running in the halls can be dangerous to your health. Another general safety rule that you want to keep in mind is whenever lifting heavy objects, lift with your legs, not your back. Now let's talk about working in the departmental shops. The department maintains a research machine shop, a student machine shop, and a wood shop. Access to these shops is available to faculty, staff, and students who have completed the appropriate training course. The training course for the metal shop is taught by the student shop supervisor, currently Jack Pitts. The wood shop class is taught by the wood shop su supervisor, currently Fred Slock. Make arrangements with the shop supervisor and your research advisor, principal investigator, or supervisor for approval for you to take the class. After you complete the training period, you will be issued a code to the door and you will be allowed access to the shops for which you've been trained 24 hours a day, seven days a week to work on your research projects. Bear in mind that when working after hours, you should avoid working alone. That way, if you are injured, there is someone to summon help. In any event, you must keep the shop doors unlocked when working alone. Then, someone walking by who sees that you are injured will have immediate access to get in, call for help, and try to administer first aid to you. Be sure to lock the door when you leave to keep out unauthorized persons. Let's continue by talking about a general class of hazards or potentially hazardous situations associated with chemicals. Most chemicals are not inherently dangerous, but they can become so under some circumstances. This is a good place to reiterate that accidents are caused by ignorance and carelessness. Specifically, they happen when chemicals are handled carelessly or when they're handled by a person who is not trained in general procedures for safe handling of chemicals or when the person handling them is simply unaware of the specific properties of the material that they're working with. Materials classified as chemicals are found in virtually all areas of the, de of the department, specifically including research and teaching labs, shops, and the stockroom. Since all employees work in or pass through one or more of these areas, 
it is important that everyone have at least a general knowledge of the do's and don'ts for these materials. The most general rule is simply be careful around materials you don't understand. A bottle of acid will not jump off of a bench top and burn you, but you can be harmed if you knock a bottle off the bench top and break it, or if you carelessly walk into someone carrying an open container of material. Of course, none of this applies to me. I'm a video star, not a chemist. General classes of hazards associated with chemicals include health, flammability, reactivity, and skin contact. Health and skin contact are the most relevant to casual visitors to laboratories. The routes by which materials may attack you are ingestion, that is, eating them, inhalation, that is, breathing them, and skin contact. Let's get down to sp some specific details concerning safe and proper handling of chemicals. First, a small item of housekeeping. All chemical containers must be labeled to define the chemical contents. This is simply prudent laboratory practice. There's a limit to how long you can remember what's in a particular container, especially if you get to be my age. Also, it doesn't do any good to mark a solvent container with a pen that dissolves in the solvent that's in the container. A good technique for making your label more robust is to simply cover it with plain old scotch tape. Another important motivation for accurate labeling is, when you finish using a chemical, if it's hazardous, it must be disposed of as hazardous waste. If it's not labeled, A, you can't figure out whether or not it needs to be disposed of as hazardous waste, and B, the cost of disposing of unknown waste, which might be hazardous, is very much higher than the cost of disposing of known waste. So, the solution is simple. Label all containers with permanent ink. Now let's list some general rules for working with chemicals. First, the undesirable effects of chemicals on your flesh typically scale with the softness of the tissue that they come in contact with. Because your eyes are some of the softest tissue in your body, it is imperative that you wear safety glasses or a face shield whenever working with chemicals. Second, Wear rubber gloves and a rubber apron when working with acids and other corrosives. The boss of a former co coworker of mine was once sitting at a lab bench when he accidentally knocked over a beaker and spilled nitric acid on some very tender skin, which took many months to heal. He still regrets not having had his apron on. Never handle acids in open containers outside a fume hood and make sure the hood has been f approved for use with corrosive materials. Corrosive fumes are very hard on delicate electronic parts. There are two of these hoods acceptable for use with corrosives in the department, so designated by these labels. This one here in the departmental chem room, 119 JFB. The second one is in the optoelectronic materials lab, 328 JFB. The two hoods just described are exhausted outside of the building and approved for use with corrosive materials. There are also a number of hoods throughout the building, like this one, indeed all of the others in the building, the exhaust of which is connected to the building exhaust system, which is made out of galvanized ducting. They are appropriate for use with volatile solvents, but not for use with corrosives. Please check and make sure that you see this corrosive label on the hood before you use it with corrosives. Also, make sure that the hood is in proper working order. On the hood in the departmental chem room, there is supplied an actual airflow meter so that you can look at and instantly see from the flow meter that the hood is in fact working. Do this every time you use it. With other hoods, you can improvise with a simple strip of soft paper like a piece of Kim wipe. Another general rule to keep in mind is that the hazard of a chemical typically increases with concentration and temperature. Hot acid is typically more corrosive than room temperature or cold acid. Hence, you need to be more careful with hot acid than you do with room temperature acids. Goji Kodama in the chemistry department once spilled hot nitric acid on the soft skin on the inside part of his arm. 
despite the fact that he had his arm under cold water within a few seconds and held it there for 20 minutes, a skin graft was required. Now let's talk about chemical storage. The most important thing to remember here is that chemicals should be stored so as to avoid incompatibilities. You simply need to dig out your departmental safety manual and find Appendix G, which lists the kinds of materials that may be stored together and the ones that need to be segregated from others. Next, let's talk about procedures for dealing with chemical spills. Spills are something you want to have thought about in advance so that you're not reading the instructions while the chemical that you have spilled is sitting on the floor eating through everything in its vicinity. The most important rule here is spill avoidance is much more important than cleanup. If you want to avoid cleaning up a spill, plan beforehand how to avoid making the spill in the first place. The departmental stockroom has a supply of chemical absorbent pillows as well as special absorbent paper towels and some stuff called mercury zorb, which amalgamates mercury. If you have a mercury spill that generates a bulk quantity of mercury, we have a small vacuum pump in the optoelectronic materials lab that has been outfitted for cleaning up mercury spills. Now let's talk about disposing of chemicals after you're finished with them. Basically, there are two things you need to know to properly dispose of chemicals. The first is that violations of EPA regulations on waste disposal can be very expensive. The university recently received a $15,000 fine for people, some of whom are in this department, not following the regulations for disposing of hazardous chemicals. The University of Wyoming got a $90,000 fine, and always right there at the top of any list is Stanford. They got their fine negotiated down to $600,000. The message here is quite simple. Don't you be responsible for our receiving a major fine for safety violations. The second thing you need to know is that the procedure for properly disposing of chemicals has gotten much simpler. All you have to do is fill out this tag available from the gray cabinet in the stockroom. Furthermore, help in filling out the tag is available in at least two places, on the internet, in the EHS page, as mentioned earlier, or within the department. Probably the most knowledgeable person in the department on how to fill out such tags is the hazardous waste coordinator, currently Wayne Wingert, who lives in 327 JFB. The easiest way to get a hold of him is simply to leave a phone message. His phone number is 13020, or leave a note on the whiteboard in 327 JFB. I'm probably the second most knowledgeable person. You can contact me by phone at 17462. My office is 329 JFB. Both Wayne and I have phone mail. Just leave a message there. I'm also accessible on email through either the Depart Departmental Novell Net or the IBM Network. Find one of us and we'll train you in the legal, economical, and environmentally sound procedures for waste disposal. Now let me give you a list of some common chemicals you may encounter in the physics department, along with a brief description of some of the do's and don'ts for handling them. Let's start with some common corrosives, hydrochloric, nitric, acetic, and phosphoric acid, as well as sodium, potassium, and ammonium hydroxide. These are all common corrosives, acids and bases that are found in various labs throughout the department. When handling any of these materials, it's good to remember the rules that I gave you at the outset, namely, the hazard and therefore the tissue damage suffered by you increases with concentration, increases with temperature, and increases very quickly with the sensitivity of the tissue that the corrosives come in contact with. If you, for example, get one of them in contact with the hard, tough skin on the palms of your hands, immediately rinse the area off for at least five minutes with cold water. If you've had any significant amount of contact with the corrosive, you should call the burn center at the University Hospital, extension 12700, for full information on how to proceed. Again, protection is the rule. 
Wear rubber gloves and rubber apron when handling corrosives. Certainly wear safety glasses, if not a full face shield. You most assuredly do not, under any circumstances, want to get any of these corrosive materials into your eyes. A former coworker got acetone under her contact lenses. It was a very unpleasant experience. Another material that's becoming more common since the department is moving towards semiconductors is hydrofluoric acid. HF is really dangerous stuff. It should be used with utmost caution and preparation. I have graphic evidence of how bad HF is right here on my finger. I got two drops of anhydrous HF on my finger about 18 years ago. The problem with HF is, unlike other acid, by the time you feel a burning sensation, the damage has already been done, and unless treated, leads to fun things like gangrene. It's important that you wear rubber gloves whenever handling hydrofluoric acid. The problem is, the skin is relatively permeable to it, and it doesn't hurt. My finger didn't start to hurt for hours. It just goes through the skin. But then the fluoride reacts with the calcium in your bones, making insoluble calcium fluoride, which stays there forever. The two drops that I got on my finger required plastic surgery to repair. The associated nerve damage healed in about 10 years. This is really bad stuff. Another potentially dangerous material is dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO. By itself, it's quite an inert and non-toxic. The problem is it's a fantastic solvent. It'll dissolve almost anything. So if you take something that's toxic or corrosive and dissolve it in the DMSO, it goes through your skin like gangbusters and takes along whatever's dissolved in it. A mixture with similar properties is something called ethanolic KOH, which has historically been used as a glass cleaner. Again, the skin is relatively permeable to the ethanol, and it takes the dissolved base right along with it, thereby deepening any burns that you would have gotten from the base alone being on your skin. Cyanides are relatively common in the physics department. Cyanide salts, not hydrogen cyanide gas. This is a single crystal of potassium cyanide that we grew. The plastic bag is necessary only to keep it from reacting with atmospheric water and degrading its purity. Basically, there are only two rules you have to keep in mind when working with cyanides. Don't eat them or drop acid on them. Both of these acts are guaranteed to be fatal in adequate quantities, and the quantities are not all that large. Some research groups also use alkali metals. The thing to keep in mind with alkali metals is they are extremely reactive with water. So you can't simply take these and throw them in water, or worse yet, throw them down the sink, to dispose of them. The whole thing catches fire. Let's demonstrate by tossing a piece of sodium metal into water. Remember, this was sodium metal. The reactivity of the alkali metals increases with atomic weight. Lithium, which is lighter, is less reactive than the sodium we just demonstrated. Potassium is more reactive, rubidium is still more reactive, and cesium is more reactive yet. I once discovered that Teflon, most inert of all ingredients, ignites spontaneously in vacuum in contact with cesium. Handle with care. Other toxic materials that are found around the department are laser dyes. And this can be a real can of worms because the laser dye manufacturers don't typically list them as being toxic because their toxicity has never been measured. To complicate matters, they're often dissolved in toxic solvents like dioxane or toluene or methanol or DMSO. Finally, chlorinated solvents are quite common around the department. Carbon tetrachloride and trichloroethylene are carcinogenic. Since they're carcinogenic, you need to be extremely careful when working with them. Use them only in a fume hood, and be sure that you wear rubber gloves at all times. Polyvinyl chloride gloves are not recommended for use with trichloroethylene. Polyvinyl chloride, by the way, is the standard material of construction 
of the cheap surgical type gloves that you can find easily around the department. Be sure that you use neoprene, which is also available from the stockroom. Now let's discuss the relatively large area of material safety data sheets, MSDSs. A material safety data sheet, such as the one I have here, is required by federal law to be shipped with the first shipment of every chemical sent to a buyer. It contains information about the physical, chemical, and health properties of the particular chemical. An excellent description of how to read a material safety data sheet is contained on the Environmental Health and Safety webpage. It's currently accessed from the Waste Management and Pollution Prevention Manual main menu. And if you simply click on Material Safety Data Sheets, there's an example. The Material Safety Data Sheet for acetone has been very well annotated by Rob Jackson, who works here on campus at Environmental Health and Safety. It gives you lots of insight on what all the various sections of the Material Safety Data Sheet mean. Let's quickly go through a description of this one, which is for acetone. These safety data sheets are broken up into various sections, which are common to most of the safety data sheets. Different manufacturers, by the way, use different formats. The first one is chemical identification, and the primary information that's available there is data on the properties of the chemical. This helps you ensure by inspection that the chemical that you have is properly identified. In addition to the chemical name, and the formula, there's also a quick overview of the hazards associated with the chemical, along with various common names for it. Also mentioned is the health, flammability, reactivity, and skin contact information. The second section lists hazardous ingredients. This is almost never useful in a laboratory situation. The third section has physical data, and actually this section can be a good source of data such as melting and boiling points, vapor pressure, density, that sort of thing. For one thing, it helps ensure that the material that you've got in your hand is the stuff being described on the material safety data sheet. The fourth section describes fire and explosion hazards, and the important piece of information here is the flash point along with the explosive concentrations. Flash point is an empirical measure of the temperature at which the material starts to burn under a specified set of combustion conditions. Basically what they do is they take a container of material and swing it through a flame. The important thing that you need to know is the lower the listed temperature, the more hazardous the material. Specifically, if the listed flash point is below room temperature and you're using the material in an area which spark or flame may be present, you have a potential hazard. Examples include acetone. Its flash point is 15 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 10 centigrade. Octane, which by the way is the primary ingredient in gasoline, its flash point is 56 degrees Fahrenheit or 13 degrees centigrade. And ethylene glycol, whose flash point is 241 degrees Fahrenheit, which converts to 116 degrees centigrade. From reading these, one sees that acetone constitutes a considerable fire hazard at room temperature. Gasoline is somewhat less hazardous. Ethylene glycol is only a minimal hazard. The section entitled Health Hazard Data gives you information about the quantities or concentration of the material that will probably make you sick. TLV, the threshold limit value, is the concentration in air in which you can safely work 40 hours a week, 750 parts per million in the case of acetone. EHS has or can acquire test equipment for measuring the concentration in your work area if you're concerned about it. The term LD50 for some kind of animal is an extremely important number. It gives you the lethal dose, LD stands for lethal dose, that kills 50% of the test animals under the conditions being described by whatever follows the words LD50, ingestion, inhalation, whatever. Here we see that LD50 for white rats is 9.7 grams per kilogram. So, to the extent that you're willing to model yourself as a 70 kilogram, 
that, that is 154 pound white rat, this means that if you drank 680 grams, which is 860 milliliters, which corresponds to almost a quart, if you drank that much acetone, you would have a 50% chance of dying. Hence, acetone is not terribly toxic by ingestion. In fact, it's slightly less toxic than ethanol, good old drinking alcohol, which is listed as about 6 grams per kilogram for LD50. For sodium cyanide, on the other hand, LD50 for white rats is 6.4 milligrams per kilogram. Our mythical 70 kilogram white rat now has a 50% chance of survival for a 450 milligram dose. This is a piece about a quarter inch on a side. Once again, it gives you an idea whether you have to ingest a large quantity or small quantity before it will have deleterious effects on you. Section 6 on reactivity gives you a list of other materials with which the material that you're reading about is incompatible. And it also tells you what the reaction products are if these two materials come into contact. Unfortunately, the information here is often misleading because, let's face it, material safety data sheets are written by lawyers and bureaucrats whose primary interest is in figuring out how to avoid having their company sued. So they tend to be excessively conservative at the risk of not giving you potentially useful information. Specifically, they overstate the potential hazards. In many cases, it's the boy who cried wolf syndrome, and you have difficulty separating materials that really are hazardous from those for which the hazards have been inflated. Section 7 describes spill and leak procedures. It gives you information on what you need to do if you spill some of the material. The biggest thing you need to know about spill and leak procedures is to read them before you buy the material. So you can also buy the material, the equipment, for dealing with the spills. You don't want to be thumbing through the yellow pages when you've got five gallons of acetone or sulfuric acid sitting on your floor. Unfortunately, again, these are often inflated. The MSDS for ethanol, for example, claims that you need to wear self-contained breathing apparatus for cleaning up spills. Section 8 is special protection information. This lists equipment that you should be using or wearing when you work with this material. So now that you know all this good stuff about what's in material safety data sheets, where do you find them? The primary source within the physics department is the gray file cabinet just inside the door in the stock room. There are a number of specialized materialized material safety data sheets in the optoelectronic materials lab. There's a relatively large database in the chemistry department, which is accessed through either the environmental health and safety web page or directly through the university gopher system. Finally, a complete compendium of all the material safety data sheets for all the chemicals that have ever been received on campus is stored in the receiving department. To access them, simply call the material safety data sheet coordinator in the receiving department at 1-8671. Note that this function may be moved to environmental health and safety in the future. This completes our discussion of chemical safety. If you need assistance or additional help or information, I'm probably your first point of contact. Remember, my office is 329 JFB, my phone number is 17462, and my email address is delong at pclab.physics.utah.edu. Now let's talk about cryogenic fluids. Cryogenic fluids are a class of materials whose chief property is the fact that they are very cold and therefore able to cool other materials. The primary cryogenic fluids found in the department are liquid nitrogen and liquid helium. Cryogenic fluids are transported and used in thermally insulated containers, glass or stainless steel bottles, called thermos bottles or doers. They have a vacuum space between the walls, or 
They are buckets made out of styrofoam or a similarly poor thermal conductor. There are three potential hazards associated with cryogenic materials. Chief amongst them is the possibility of frostbite. Certainly if you get any part of your body into liquid nitrogen, you will suffer severe frostbite from it. Again, your eyes are very sensitive and very irreplaceable. Always wear safety glasses or a face shield when transferring cryogenic fluids from one container to another. Similarly, any objects that have been cooled to cryogenic temperatures by these materials are equally capable of generating frostbite if you touch those materials. The hazard with cold materials increases with their thermal conductivity. The obvious way to avoid contracting frostbite from cryogenic materials is to never directly touch anything that is at these low temperatures. If you must somehow touch objects at these low temperatures, you need to thermally insulate yourself from them by a poor conductor. Poor conductors are things like styrofoam, cloth, and rubber. By the way, the stories you've heard about your tongue sticking to cold metal are absolutely true. It would have to be surgically removed. Contrary to what you may have heard, I'm not dumb enough to demonstrate this with my tongue, but I will simulate it with a wet rag. Wet fingers, by the way, work just as well as a wet tongue or a wet rag. You would get serious frostbite under these circumstances. A second potential hazard from cryogenic materials is the fact that they vaporize. The use of cryogenic materials is typically not a problem in a well-ventilated room. However, if you're working with cryogenic fluids in a poorly ventilated environment, keep in mind that you could have a problem. There's a final hazard associated with cryogenic fluids. They're often transported in evacuated glass thermos bottles. And because you've got a combination of glass and vacuum, if these are dropped or otherwise broken, pieces of flying glass can result. To avoid this, one should always tape or cover the outside of an evacuated glass container with some kind of plastic mesh, as demonstrated in the example here, or by covering it with black electrical tape. Next, let's talk about electrical and RF safety. RF, by the way, stands for radio frequency. And what we mean is radio frequency or microwave radiation. The primary danger from electrical hazards is via electrocution. The fatal path for electrocution results from an electrical current passing through your chest area, specifically passing through your heart. The cause of such a path, and by the way, this is the classic electrocution from reaching out of the bathtub, is, for example, a voltage applied to one extremity, like your hand, and a lower voltage existing at another extremity, like your foot or your other hand, such that current goes from one to the other through your heart. To avoid having such a current path going through your heart, make sure you don't have two extremities at considerably different voltages at any time. A third sort of extremity could occur from sitting on a metal chair and picking up voltage with your hand. Again, insulation is the issue. Are you sitting on a metal stool wearing shorts or one with a padded fiberglass or fiber or plastic or leather seat? Are the chair legs on a tile floor or are they in a puddle of water on a concrete floor? Electrocution is one of the more common causes of laboratory deaths among graduate students. Don't let it happen to you. Everybody wants to know, what's the fatal voltage? What voltage can I stand between my hands or between a leg and a foot that won't be fatal? The answer is, it's not the voltage, but the current going through your heart that's the critical parameter. Between 10 and 100 milliamps through your body will cause fibrillation of your heart, leading to death. Thus, the answer to the question of what's a fatal voltage is, there's no way to tell. It depends totally on the electrical condition of your skin. Your skin is a relatively thin, non-conductive layer, and all the blood that's in between is a pretty good conductor. So, depending on the condition of your skin, whether it's real thick calluses, or say, the soft skin on the back of your hand, makes a big difference. 
And thir furthermore, if it's abraded or cut or wet or been soaked in salt solution, the resistance, and hence the voltage you can survive, changes by orders of magnitude. It's been reported that voltages as small as 6 to 20 volts have been fatal in cases where the skin has been abraded or was conductive because it was soaked in water or a salt solution. The classic case of electric electrocution is in the bathtub where you've got extremely good electrical conductivity and a rel readily available path to ground. On the other hand, nearly everyone has survived touching the same common 110 volts with dry skin and no obvious path to ground. The important thing to realize is the current path. To be fatal, the path must include your heart. And the way to avoid that is to wear rubber-soled shoes and keep one hand in your pocket at all times. Then the working hand is the only thing that can contact fatally high voltages. And there's no place for the current to leave your body. That's the safest condition to be in. Some other issues to discuss while we're talking about electrical problems. If you're repairing a piece of equipment, make sure that the line cord is unplugged. In this case, simply turning the power switch off is not good enough. Also, be sure you make it clear to coworkers who may want to use the equipment that you're repairing that it is inoperative. Simply put a note on it. This is called a lockout system of operation, where you lock out use by someone who doesn't know that the piece of equipment is being repaired. Another thing to remember is to watch out for large capacitors in some equipment. Even with the line cord removed, they can hold potentially, potentially lethal charges for hours or days. If your hands are going to be near any large capacitors during repairs, make sure you discharge the capacitors first. It's also a good time to explain the standard American wiring convention, that is, the color coding. Typical 110 volt single phase power in this country is delivered in wire with a specific color coding. The black wire is always the one that's described as hot, meaning that its voltage is above neutral or ground. The white wire is always the neutral. It operates at approximately ground potential. And the green wire is the equipment grounding conductor. Current is carried from the source Utah Power and Light, to your application by the black wire and the white wire. The green wire is never intended to carry current except in case of an electrical disaster, like the hot wire coming in contact with the metal case of a piece of equipment. That's precisely the eventuality that the ground wire is designed to protect you against. Without it, the metal case of the piece of equipment could accidentally be at high voltage. If you touch it while some other extremity is in contact with ground, you could be electrocuted. The fact that we are in constant proximity to potentially lethal voltages, yet electrocution is rare, means that the safety system works in most cases. One other possible source of safety hazards in the labs is from radio frequency or microwave emissions. The part of the body most susceptible to microwaves is absorption in your eyes. A reasonable number to work with is a maximum power of 1 milliwatt per square centimeter. Hence, a quick calculation shows that if you are closer than about 10 centimeters to a common laboratory source putting out 400 milliwaves, milliwatts of microwave power, you may be in danger. Let's move on to the issue of laser safety. There are a number of relatively high-power lasers in the department. The principal hazard from lasers is burns. Burns to your eyes and burns to your skin. A good number to remember is that your eyes will sustain permanent damage at a power of approximately 1 milliwatt. Common helium neon lasers, the red ones found all over the place, put out about a half milliwatt for exactly that reason. The skin, on the other hand, starts to burn, and you can certainly feel a burning sensation at a power of something like a half to one watt. 
Let me demonstrate the fact that you can get severe burns from a laser beam with this piece of paper. The power in this laser beam is about 4 watts. Needless to say, it's sufficient to burn your skin. If it hits your eyes, they're gone. Remember, your retina is also black. When working with high-power lasers, you must wear eye protection to guard against accidental exposure to stray reflections. This is far more important if you work with a laser whose emission is not in the vis visible region of the spectrum, CO2, YAG, nitrogen, for example. These goggles are designed to absorb at a particular laser wavelength. In any case, avoid having the laser beam at the height of your eyes where you normally sit or stand. There are a couple of other potential hazards associated with lasers. As I mentioned earlier, laser dyes are typically toxic and in some cases are dissolved in toxic solvents. In addition to ingestion, some are dissolved in DMSO, so skin absorption can also be a serious problem. Always wear gloves impermeable to the specific solvent you are working with when mixing laser dye. A third possible source of safety problems with lasers is that of electrocution by the power supplies. Clearly the voltage and the current available are far more than adequate to electrocute you. Another topic for discussion is the presence of large magnets. There are some large superconducting magnets in the department and there are several potential hazards associated with them. The primary hazard associated with magnets is the fact that the induced force in a ferromagnetic material that is brought into close proximity to the magnet increases like 1 over R to the seventh. A technician once wheeled a metal cart into a room in the University Med Center where there was a large imaging magnet like this one. Despite warnings, he got the cart too close and it went crashing into the side of the magnet. Had there been a patient inside, the patient would easily have been decapitated by the force. These are extremely powerful magnets we're talking about. The most useful piece of information here is, if you're working around one of these big magnets when it's energized, you must use tools made of copper beryllium or some similar non-magnetic material. Now let me turn the program over to Dave Keita, who will be talking to you about radiation safety. The subject of radiation safety is an immense one and covers a wide variety of environments, from nuclear power plants to educational settings. In this brief discussion, we will focus on the laboratory use of radioactive sources only. Other applications are beyond the scope of this presentation and need to be dealt with as they occur by your supervisor. If you are ever in doubt about policy or procedure in the acquisition, handling, or disposal of radiation sources, or in the proper safety precautions, don't take chances. Either contact a member of the Physics Department Safety Committee, or directly contact the university's radiological health office. Prior to working with radiation sources, all university employees are required to attend a class on radiation health and safety given periodically by the radiological health department. For the date and location of the next class, call Radiological Health at 16141. For our non-technical staff, i.e. those whose jobs do not involve the use of radioactive materials, the basic principle of radiation safety is simple. Do not handle any radioactive materials and avoid areas which display this required and universally recognized radiation alert sign. Every lab that contains radiation source materials must have a sign bearing this symbol on its door informing you of what types of radioactive materials are present in the lab. Most radioactive sources within the department emit relatively little radiation and so are quite benign if handled appropriately. However, in the absence of detailed knowledge of, about any given radioactive material, you should treat the radioactive material as potentially hazardous and under no circumstances should you touch it. If you must be in an area with radioactive sources, be sure you know that where they are so you can avoid them. If you believe there are radiation sources or radiation hazards in an area which is not properly labeled as such, you should immediately contact your supervisor for corrective action. If you have a continuing concern about the possible radiation hazards or any other safety issue within the department, directly contact the chair of the Physics Department Safety Committee. 
For those of you who will possibly be working with radioactive materials, it is necessary to go into some technical detail so that you will become familiar with the terminology. Ionizing radiation. Radiation is a form of energy that can be transmitted through a vacuum. Ionizing radiation has sufficient energy that its interaction with the atoms and molecules can separate those atoms or molecules into charged components. Ionizing radiation can cause irreparable damage to tissue, including chromosomes. Examples of ionizing radiation include neutrons, electrons, ions, or electromagnetic waves from the ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma regions of the spectrum. That's what radiation is. How is the quantity and impact measured? The Curie is a unit of radioactivity defined as 3.7 times 10 to the 10th disintegrations per second. For example, a calibrated microcurie 210 polonium source will emit 3.7 times 10 to the 4 alphas per second. Typical laboratory sources are in the microcurie range to millicurie range. The radioactivity of a source alone, however, does not give you the complete story of its biological effects. Six factors influence the severity of the radiation exposure. First, the particle radioactivity, or number of curies. Second, the particle energy, MeV or KeV energy. Third, the particle type, gamma, neutron, beta, or alpha. Fourth, the length of exposure, or time. Fifth, the distance between you and the source, or in other words, the 1 over R squared attenuation. And sixth, the amount of shielding material between you and the source. The safety, Department's safety manual contains a table of governmentally determined tolerable radiation doses for workers in the field. You should study this section and understand it prior to working with any radioactive materials. Here are some general rules for different types of sources. Gamma sources are generally safe in the microcurie range, even for hour-long exposures. In the millicurie range, one should limit one's exposure to only a few minutes and use tongs to handle the source. The tongs give a 1 over R squared decrease in the radiation flux. Microcurie beta sources, with energies less than 400 keV, are similar to microcurie gamma sources. One hour exposures are generally safe. For beta sources with energy greater than 400 keV, use more precaution. Use tongs for handling the source and keep it in a plastic box when not in use. Electroplated alpha sources are generally not a hazard for external exposure. The particle energy deposition takes place on the dead skin layer and therefore has no biological consequence. For liquid, gas, and powder alpha sources, one must be careful not to inhale, eat, or inject the source into the bloodstream through a puncture wound. The source may selectively concentrate in the lungs, liver, or kidney, causing a great deal of local radiation damage in critical body organs. Neutron sources are typically generated using a highly radioactive alpha source and a target material which generates neutrons when hit by the alpha particles. A typical neutron source of 10 to the 6 neutrons per second would use about one Curie alpha source. Although the alpha source is shielded and poses no danger, some alpha sources also emit gamma radiation, which can provide substantial radiation even after passing through the shield material. An integrated exposure of 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8th neutrons per square centimeter at the skin is generally safe. Neutron sources should not be picked up with, by the hands, but should be picked up with tongs to reduce radiation exposure to the fingers. It is a good practice when handling radioactive materials to use a portable radiation detector to get an idea of what your potential dose rate is. Commercial radiation monitors exist for all types of particles and are usually calibrated to give dose rates in REMS. Difficult part, different particles usually require different detectors. For example, a Geiger-Muller tube works for electrons and protons, but not for alpha particles or neutrons. To give you an idea of what is truly a dangerous dose, the following table gives the effects of a whole body radiation dose obtained within a few hours. For a one rem dose, no bi detectable biological changes are expected. For a 10 rem dose, blood changes are detectable and there is a small cancer risk. For a 100 rem dose, one expects some injury with no long-term disability. For a 200 rem dose, one expects injury and some long-term disability. For a 400 rem dose, one expects 50% death rate in 30 days. For a 600 rem dose, one can expect 100% death rate within 30 days. For a 10,000 rem dose, 
one can expect a 50% death rate in four days, and at 100,000 REMs, quick death will occur. In this table, the REM is a measure of radiological exposure corrected for particle type and energy. It is directly related to the amount of ionizing energy deposited in the body. The listed effects for a 100 REM and greater exposure will usually result from gamma and neutron radiation, as these are the only particles which can penetrate the entire body. Such high exposures can only occur in industrial settings such as nuclear reactors, high-energy particle accelerators, kilocurie gamma sources, and nuclear crit criticality accidents such as Chernobyl. These sources are not present in the physics department. <laughs> However, there are some shielded kilocurie gamma sources located in the medical school. The safe handling of radioactive materials involves a few clear principles. Number one, minimize your exposure to all radiation. Under no circumstance should you inhale or ingest radioactive material. This means that absolutely no eating, drinking, or smoking may take place in any area in which there are radioactive sources. Wear gloves and other protective clothing, even if a remote possibility of contamination of the hands and body exists. Subsequent ingestion of radioactivity may occur from hand-to-mouth transfer or from inhalation if these precautions are not taken. Ingested or inhaled radioactive material is far more hazardous than it is just on the skin. It emits and harms you as long as it is in your body. Number two, some radiation sources are quite safe. For example, calibrated low-activity gamma sources are usually provided in sealed plastic discs so that unless you deliberately cut into the protective packaging, there is no danger of contamination. Other sources of charged particles, such as alpha, cannot be similarly protected because unacceptable energy degradation of the emitted particle would occur. These sources are frequently electroplated onto a foil. With age or mishandling, the source material can flake off the foil, causing potential significant radiation hazard, primarily due to possible ingestion or inhalation. You should never touch the foil of one of these sources. The danger of irradiation is usually not the worry here. The main concern is the deposit of salty sweat that you may leave on the foil, which may chemically weaken or dissolve the protective foil layer. If the protective foil is damaged, subsequent users might pick up contamination or permanent exposure from the unprotected radioactive material itself. Fingerprints and sweat can also change the calibrated energy and radioactivity of the electroplated alpha sources. All such sources must be regularly checked for source integrity by the university's radiological health office. Always have the appropriate radiation monitoring equipment on hand when using sources. Not only will you need this to determine the level of dose you are receiving during your use of the source, but you will also need this to check for accidental contamination of you and your work area after using the sources. If there, are, if there is any chance of acquiring a dose greater than 100 millirem during a major portion of your body in any calendar quarter, you may be required to wear a film badge. Such doses are at least theoretically possible from the departmental Van de Graaff accelerator and x-ray machine. The badges are provided at no charge by radiological health. These badges are processed at regular intervals and tell you what your integrated whole body exposure has been. Keep your area safe for others. The fact that radiation sources are present and what type they are should be clearly labeled at the entrance to the lab, and the container holding the sources should be clearly labeled. All sources should be clearly labeled with nuclei and activity. Return the sources to their storage containers when done with them. Do not leave them lying around on tabletops. Do not take radio sources out of the lab without making a written record of the new location of the source and its intended use. This will ensure that sources do not become lost. Losing a radioactive source is a very serious affair. Discard radioactive waste only according to approved methods using properly designated and labeled containers. Never throw potentially contaminated items in trash cans. This is a very serious offense. If you have any sources whose integrity or identity is in doubt, contact the university's radiological health office for source checks and or disposal instructions. The basic procedure is for the designated responsible user, in this case currently Michael Solomon, to call the radiological health department for pickup. Similarly, call Mike if you suspect something may be a radioactive source. In case of an emergency, any accident, injury, or loss of control of a radiation source that could cause an excessive or uncontrolled radiation exposure to any individual is considered a radiation emergency. The first action to take in any emergency is to provide first aid, 
if you are trained, to the injured persons and or prevent further injury. Persons should immediately leave the affected area until the extent of the radiological hazard has been determined, but should remain in the general vicinity until they have been personally scanned for contamination. In the case of fire or injury, first call public safety. If there is some reason you cannot reach public safety, call the Salt Lake City Emergency Services at 9911. In the event of personal contamination, call the radiological health at 16141 during normal office hours. Clearly state the nature of the emergency and follow all instructions. Do not hang up the phone until directed to do so. Here is a summary of the radiation safety points. First, know the identity and activity of all sources that you use and have the appropriate radiation monitors on hand. Number two, never eat, drink, or smoke when using radioactive sources or in an area where radioactive sources have been used. Number three, wear gloves and other protective clothing when a danger of contamination exists. Number four, check hands and body for accidental contamination after the use of sources. Number five, wear a film badge if there is any possibility of receiving greater than 100 millirems per calendar quarter. Number six, never tamper with or physically modify a commercially prepared radioactive source. Number seven, do not remove sources from the designated lab area unless a written record is made of their relocation. Number eight, report all accidents to your supervisors and to radiological health in cases of emergency. This has been a brief introduction to some aspects of radiation safety. For more details, see the Physics Department Safety Manual. Thank you, Dave. As a parting comment, let me remind you that the two most common causes of accidents are ignorance and carelessness. We have given you a lot of information and listed sources of additional information to overcome the problem of ignorance. It is your responsibility to actually internalize that knowledge and apply it conscientiously in your work habits, that is, to work carefully. Many years ago, I learned a very important and relevant lesson in the classroom from the United States Army. You are all familiar with it. The Army used it for a very specific, important, and particularly relevant application. If anything can go wrong, it will. Therefore, figure out what disasters will have the most devastating consequences and make sure they don't happen. Or, if they do happen, that you have contingency plans to deal with the consequences. Thank you, and please help us promote a safe and productive working environment.